everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Anushka, and I help coordinate the Alina Health Deep Brain Stimulation Program. Our speakers today are Dr. Eleanor Arehek, Movement Disorder Specialist at Naran Neurological Clinic, and Dr. Kyle Nelson, our neurosurgeon from Metropolitan Neurosurgery. Dr. Arehek and Dr. Nelson have a very informative presentation plan for us today. Unfortunately, our patient voice who has had the DBS surgery was not able to join us today. But if you visit our website at naranclinic.com slash DBS, you have the ability to listen to previously reported programs that include testimonials. And if you'd like to listen to those testimonials, they're available online, or you can email me. I believe most of you did email me to register for the program, and I can direct you to those testimonials and where you can hear them. Today, please feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Arehak and Dr. Nelson in the chat. And in order to view the chat, you can hover your mouse at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and you should see the chat option there. If for some reason you're not able to access that chat option, you can email me. And again, many of you should have my email from registering your questions and I will share them with the doctors. And if you think of any other questions after today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to Kelly, our DBS nurse care coordinator or myself. Kelly's phone number is 612-863-0381. And you can also reach out to me at 651-241-8297. And with that, we'll welcome Dr. Rehak to begin sharing her presentation. Uh, thanks, Anushka, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, Deep brain stimulation therapy is uh, one of the more rewarding um, treatments that we offer patients. And so um, really a, a great um, topic to discuss and I'm happy that you were all able to make it. The goal today is to kind of give a quick overview of the, of the therapy and the process for getting surgery and and just try to um, bring some awareness to what it is and, and how to decide if, if it's a, a right treatment option for you. And then Dr. Nelson's on and he'll, he'll talk through the details of surgery and then we'll um, have plenty of time to go through questions and answers at the end. So uh, deep brain stimulation is uh, broadly speaking, uh, high frequency stimulation. So we use electrodes that go into the brain and stimulate different targets. So depending on what we're treating with tremor or Parkinson's, we, we can target different areas of the brain and, and uh, deliver really effective therapy. For Parkinson disease, uh, deciding whether you're a candidate or whether it's the right treatment for you is a really personal decision. And so we spend a lot of time in clinic when I see people talking through the pros and cons and risks and benefits to the surgery. And so that, that's a long discu discussion um, that we have prior to, to moving forward. But generally, if you're on medication and, and the medications stop working as well, and, and you start feeling that you're having more wearing off time where your Parkinson symptoms return, or let's say you take a, a dose of your medication and you start getting side effects from that, um, that's when it, we can start looking at the deep brain stimulation is an option. Typically that's at least four or five years into the disease and, and sometimes even beyond that, depending on, on your particular um, disease experience. So this slide just, um, here, sorry, let's see. Go through. This slide just shows kind of some of that up and down that you might be experiencing with your medication. So that's carbidopa, levodopa causes the most kind of up and down. It's, it's the more common um, effective medication that we have. So pretty much everybody ends up on carbidopa, levodopa. Um, but over time, as your disease reaches more moderate stage or later stages, it can have more of these ups and downs where you're either 
um, above the therapeutic window having bothersome dyskinesias or, or down here in this off state where your Parkinson's symptoms are returning. And so keeping you um, in this, what we call on time window or therapeutic window uh, with medications alone can get more challenging in this moderate or later stage. So that's when we start talking about um, implementing different therapies like DBS. The effectiveness of the surgery is um, very effective. So particularly for what we call the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So that's tremor, although um, we don't have to have tremor to get good benefit for patients. So there's a lot of patients with Parkinson's that don't have any tremor. They have more dystonia, especially if you're um, younger onset or bradykinesia, that's the slowness of movement or rigidity is that muscle stiffness that you can get that responds really well to therapy as well. Um, so there's a rating scale called the UPDRS that we use to rate some of your um, motor symptoms. And those scores in, in trials improved about 40 to 60%, so quite a bit. And then those wiggly movements, dyskinesias that people can get from the levodopa also reduced by 60 to 80%. We get reduction in that off time where your Parkinson's symptoms are back by 60%. And um, medications aren't always able to be reduced. And, and usually we can't stop the medications completely, but on average, about 30 to 40% reduction in the dose of your medications. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the symptoms that generally don't respond are um, some postural instability. So if you have a lot of balance problems that doesn't get better with the medications, then that won't necessarily respond. Uh, difficulties with speech. Uh, a lot of the symptoms we call non-motor symptoms. So that's um, cognitive changes, anxiety, depression, um, bladder, bowel issues. Th those generally don't get better with the surgery. Things that would make it um, so that you're not a good candidate for surgery um, with Parkinson's is if you have cognitive impairment to the level of dementia, then we, we generally wouldn't consider it to be a good idea just because the benefits don't outweigh the risks in that um, situation usually. If you have an atypical form of Parkinson's, so that's um, things like progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple, multiple system atrophy, or dementia with Lewy bodies, um, then it, it hasn't been shown to be effective therapy. And then through the workup process, we also try to look for things that might um, reduce how much benefit people get or increase the risk of complications. So we, we lo would look for and evaluate any um, severe psychiatric um, difficulties that someone's having. If you, even in the on state, after you take your medication, still have quite a bit of disability, then it's unlikely to provide a lot of benefit for you. Uh, similarly, if your symptoms aren't relieved by um, levodopa, that would be along those same lines that you probably won't get as much benefit from surgery. If you have a lot of other medical problems that make your surgery risk too high, um, that's a consideration. There's no exact age cutoff, so we, we consider people even over 75 into their 80s um, could be candidates, but we definitely proceed with more caution in, the, in that situation. So going through the workup, if, if you meet with me and we talk through things and decide it's probably a good thing to look at and do more workup for, we move forward with some testing. So one of the tests we do is called on-off testing. So this is where you come in off your meds in the morning and a physical therapist will do a UPDRS rating scale. So they'll look at your finger tapping, things like this, and look at your muscle stiffness and your walking. And then have you take your medications and repeat that scale to see how much benefit you get from your medications. Because we do like to see a robust response to levodopa because that's typically the symptoms that will get better with DBS. DBS just gives you that more stability and more on time and, and less side effects from your medications. So we still do like to see a robust response to the, the medication. That's about at least a 30% improvement. Insurance often requires that as well. So that's part of the, the workup. 
and it's videoed so that we can review that as a team. Um, the neuropsychological workup is, is to look for some of those cognitive changes or mood changes that is helpful to be aware of prior to surgery. And then if there's a, not a recent brain MRI, uh, we'll often get an updated brain MRI. And then after that testing's done, we have uh, DBS meetings where we meet is our uh, multidisciplinary team. So the physical therapist that does the testing for on off, the neuropsychologist, our neurosurgeon, Dr. Nelson, and then myself and our care coordinator all meet and we talk through the testing and, and the um, risks and benefits and, and where we would put the leads and, and all those things and, and try to get a good plan in place before moving forward. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to essential tremor. This is another common indication for doing DBS. Essential tremor is um, often a hand tremor or head tremor that can get um, pretty debilitating and disabling for people. And so when you get to a point where your medications have either caused too many side effects or are not helping anymore, then that's where we start talking about DBS. So I often counsel people that if you're at a point with your tremor where you can't imagine imagine continuing to live and, and deal with your tremor at the level that it's at, then considering DBS is, is a good time. Um, so contraindications are similar to with Parkinson's. If you have significant cognitive changes, if you have a lot of other medical problems, increasing your surgery risk or um, older ages, we um, have more caution there. The surgery workup's a little bit more straightforward with just that neuropsychologic testing that we do. Here is a sample of someone's writing uh, before and after surgery. So here's their baseline spiral. If you have tremor, you're probably familiar with doing, doing the, it's called Archimedes spiral. So here's the baseline and then after um, programming. So quite a bit of improvement there. Here's another flow chart looking at the timeline and, and how we move through the process. So uh, an outside doctor or a different neurologist might refer to myself or movement disorder specialist to consult and talk through pros and cons and surgery and, and any other medications we might wanna try before moving forward with testing. And then you would get the on off testing in the case of Parkinson's and then everybody gets neuropsychologic evaluation our DBS team meets, talks through things, and then if we move forward, you meet with Dr. Nelson for a consult, and then move forward with surgery, and then you would see me in the office about a month after surgery for programming. So that initial programming visit, we wait till everything heals up in the brain well, and, and then see, see me a month later uh, once you get your battery placed and, and everything heals up, and then um, I would do an initial programming visit, which is a longer visit to test out different combinations and try to get things set as well as we can. And then afterwards, you would expect about two to four visits within the next few months to um, really get things optimized. Sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes people do really well after the first couple visits. It, it depends on everybody's um, specific disease symptoms, but that's generally an outline. And here's our, our team. We have a really great team that we've put together and, and try to make it a really patient-focused experience and, and um, be in regular contact with, with patients and streamline things for everybody. Dr. Nelson will talk more about that, but um, we, we just have a really great team of, of people. And at that, I will pass it over to Dr. Nelson. Uh, let's see. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Nelson, one of the neurosurgeons at Metropolitan Neurosurgery. Uh, Dr. Rayek and myself uh, work uh, quite extensively uh, with each other uh, in uh, putting this uh, DBS program together. Um, like 
uh, Dr. Rayek said, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, streamlining this process uh, because we understand the complexities of uh, both Parkinson's as well as essential tremor disease and know that it can be a very scary time when you're facing uh, brain surgery potentially to help with that. Now, the one thing about this, and uh, unfortunately, we're unable to have a, a patient advocate available today, but many of them will say that, you know, don't, uh, don't walk to go see uh, your neurologist or neurosurgeon to talk about DBS run because it's uh, can sometimes be the best decision that you make, uh, albeit very scary and 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 kind of uncertain. Uh, oftentimes, you know, these, this is really life changing for people. Uh, and uh, you know, the process again, uh, it is brain surgery. It does come with certain risks, but uh, to see patients recover uh, and improve, you know, their symptoms and get back to you know some normalcy in life is is really a really a neat thing and, and something that both Dr. Rake and myself take a lot of pride in. So um, at the end of my presentation, we will have some time for questions. Both Dr. Rake and myself will be around to answer any specific questions. But if you guys do have questions that you want to uh, answer, you can always uh, go down to the chat box and, and type in some questions as well. So. What I want to try and break down today is, you know, brain surgery is scary for sure, and um, DBS for brain surgery is no different. So, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what we want to do is kind of break down this black box of what is it, what is involved with this? How scary is this? Does this involve, you know, drilling holes into my head and, and putting things into my brain? And, and how do you do that? And how safe is that? Um, we'll go through all those different concerns today. And, and talk about you know really what to expect even with some pictures from the operating room, uh, so that when you do hit the operating room, you know you understand what um, you know what's necessary. In all of the patients that we do DBS surgery on, I do see them all in clinic first, and generally spend you know anywhere between a half an hour and uh, you know sometimes up to 45 minutes or an hour, kind of discussing you know a lot of what we talk about here. Talk about the process. Talk about what to expect. Um, my goal is to make sure that when you hit the operating room that you know what's going to happen and mostly because that first part of the surgery is actually done awake and so I don't want I don't you know want uh, the patients to be scared uh, or you know sort of uncertain about what's what's going to happen. We do have a number of different targets for a DBS surgery um, for essential tremor it's really just one target uh, the VIM uh, nucleus in the thalamus. Um, and then uh, for Parkinson's disease, we actually have two targets, uh, one called GPI or globus pallidus and the other uh, STN or subthalamic nucleus. Now, when we're in uh, our consensus meetings, uh, when Dr. Rayhek is there and myself and the physical therapists that do the on-off testing and the neuropsych people and Kelly, um, our care coordinator, we all get together generally on about a monthly basis and review all the patients that have undergone testing and see if they are a good candidate or any concerns that we have for them. And that's where we actually discuss, you know, which target we think would be best. And that's based on uh, really all the information that we get from uh, the uh, on-off testing, all the information we get from the neuropsych evaluation. And again, part of that is a discussion that I generally have with patients, you know, when they come to see me is, what do I think the best target would be and why? And many patients have no idea, you know, what the difference is, but hopefully we try and break that down so that, you know, it makes sense to them as, as far as what we're doing. I like to do, and most people do DBS surgery in, in what stage, and what's called a staged approach. And what that means is that we actually break it up into two different uh, procedures, two different surgeries. Uh, the goal of stage one is to implant the intracranial leads. Now that surgery is done awake. Uh, which sounds very scary. Um, and the reason we do that is not because we want to torture patients. The reason we do that is because we want to test those leads to make sure that they're in the right spot, to make sure that they're actually doing what we want them to do. So generally, we have patients come into the operating room uh, off their medications. They generally have been off their medicines for about a day or so. Um, you know, so they're, people are in pretty rough shape. They're pretty rigid. They, you know, their movements are very slow. We understand all this. If they do have tremor as a part of their Parkinson's symptoms, you know, a lot of times their tremor is really kind of out of control. These are all totally expected. Um, and uh, what we want to do is when we get those leads and we want to test them to see if it does help your symptoms. Obviously, if you come in on your medications uh, and your symptoms are pretty well controlled, we may not be able to test 
uh, the system to, uh, you know, to sort of its extent. The other thing we want to test for is side effects. When we're putting these leads in, it's very easy for us to implant the lead, and if we see any side effects, we can easily move that lead. Uh, you know, just generally, it's it's not very much. It's a millimeter or two, one way or the other, but that makes all the difference in the world as far as um, programming and, and the options that we have, you know, after we get out of the operating room. That surgery generally starts uh, early in the morning, generally about 7.30 in the morning, and uh, we finish that one about noon. Now, the goal of that surgery generally in most patients is to implant both uh, leads, so uh, one on the right side and one on the left side to control symptoms, again, on the right and the left side of your body. Uh, that's done under local anesthetic. Generally, we keep people overnight in the hospital after that surgery. Uh, just because of one of the risks, which is bleeding. Uh, if that's going to happen, generally it happens in the first 24 hours after surgery. If that does happen, I want you in a place where I can tend to you and diagnose that very quickly and do any kind of uh, other procedures or whatnot that we need to to, uh, to manage that appropriately. After both those intracranial leads are placed, uh, after that first stage, um, you generally go home the next day and then come back about a week later. And uh, that's what we call the stage two procedure. And that's actually where we connect those uh, intracranial leads that were implanted. Um, we tunnel those down underneath the skin and then connect those to a little generator that you can see here on the bottom of the screen. Now that generator uh, not only does all the stimulation, uh, but it also uh, has a little battery pack in there and we have all different kinds of generators that we can use some that are rechargeable some that are non-rechargeable and uh, one of the newer versions of this actually can sense signals from the brain and that helps us uh, with programming we've been using that uh, for just a little bit under a year now and so that stage two uh, that's much shorter surgery generally that takes about an hour or so uh, that's done as what's called an outpatient meaning you come into the hospital a day of surgery we do surgery and then you generally go home later that day uh, and that's also done under general anesthesia, so you're not awake for that medicine, uh, for that procedure, and you can be on your medicines for that as well. Um, now that uh, procedure, when we get done with that, the whole system is connected, but it's generally not activated at that point. You would generally follow up with Dr. Rahek about two to three weeks after that second procedure to actually get the system programmed, and then she would work with each individual patient as far as how that programming affects the uh, use of the medications uh, that you're generally on. So really, a, you know, a two-stage procedure. Uh, at the end of that second stage, you have both leads implanted. Both are connected up to the generator, and both have been tested out. Um, and most people tolerate that well. I follow you uh, very closely in clinic afterwards to make sure things are healing up well. And obviously, you know, I'm available uh, at any point in time if there are any concerns or questions during the healing process. A little bit more on some of the details, uh, what to expect in the operating room. So basically uh, what we do is you come into the hospital day of surgery. Again, that first stage procedure is done awake. Um, we get you into the operating room. I generally will get you uh, into one of these uh, head frames. This is what's called a stereotactic head frame. Basically what it, that's used for is to give me very precise locations of where that target is, um, of where we wanna place those leads. By the time you enter the operating room, I've already done planning on an MRI scan that we did preoperatively. And what I do is uh, I plan for trajectory or placement of two leads, one on the right side, one on the left side. Um, what I'm looking for here is to make sure that, um, you know, we're avoiding any major blood vessels, that those leads are, are going into the brain and that they're targeting uh, anatomically where we think those leads need to be. Once you're in that frame, we then get uh, a CT scanner, an interoperative CT scanner in there, and we do a quick uh, CT scan. What that does is it uh, connects the uh, stereotactic frame that I placed on uh, to that MRI scan, and that gives me the coordinates of where those leads need to go. That whole process takes about 45 minutes or so to get you into that frame, get you situated on the bed, and then uh, get that scan done. Then we actually get the surgery started. Um, Here's a picture. This is uh, just a patient in that head frame um, uh, on, situated on the operating room table. And then here is that O-arm, that interoperative CT scanner that we bring in to, uh, to do that uh, registration spin. What we then do is um, make two small little incisions. Uh, they're not very big, about uh, two inches on each side. Those go right on the top of the head. 
and then we make two small little what we call burr holes or little holes in the skull. Those are about the size of a dime. Uh, and again, one on the right side, one on the left side for implantation of those leads. Uh, for Parkinson's patients, what we'll do is something called microelectro recording. This is kind of a final check for us to make sure that we're in the right spot. So what we'll do is stick a small little uh, electro into the brain and then we will monitor that uh, and see, and there's very characteristic uh, firings that we see or patterns that we see in some of these uh, certain spots of the brain. And then we use that to uh, ensure that we're in the uh, proper location. Once we feel that we're in the proper location, that's when we insert the lead into the brain and then do that interoperative testing. Generally, Dr. Rahek is there both for the recording as well as that interoperative testing. And what she'll do is she'll go through a number of uh, different uh, motor tests to see if that lead's working appropriately. And again, that's why we wanna keep you awake. That's why we want you to be off your medications. What you'll actually see is a lot of times you'll see that uh, bradykinesias or that slowness, the slow movements, as well as the rigidity just kind of melt away. Uh, it's really amazing to see as we increase the, uh, the stimulation, how that just uh, improves dramatically. Obviously with any surgery, there's you know, certain risks. Um, I consider this a, a major brain surgery uh, and with major brain surgery comes, comes real risk. Uh, luckily those risks are, are uh, very controllable and very low, uh, but risk nonetheless. Um, I, I always tell people there's three risks that we run into with DBS surgery. One is uh, we go through all this and it doesn't work. Uh, through the process that we've developed, uh, we have a very high success rate. Um, so we pick good candidates to put DBS or, uh, to put DBS leads into. Uh, we have real high success with surgery, both with uh, location of leads as well as a uh, very low risk of complications uh, and, and a very low risk of, um, of infections, which you know are, are really the, the key to, to having successful surgery. Uh, again, the three major risks that we run into are, uh, malposition of the leads or some sort of problem with the uh, with the device. Uh, again, these are very robust devices. We generally don't run into any problems with that. Uh, second would be uh, a bleeding risk. That's what, again why I keep you in the hospital that after that first stage. Uh, that's less than one percent, but um, you know it, it can happen. Um, most of the time, if we do see bleeding, it's just seen on a head CT. The patient actually doesn't experience any side effects or problems, uh, but sometimes, you know, we can see that as well. Uh, and then lastly, like I said, is a small risk of infection. Anytime you cut the skin, you're on the risk of infection. Anytime you cut the skin and put a foreign body in, something that doesn't belong to you, if that thing gets infected, a lot of times that whole system needs to come out. As you will see, um, I'm uh, you know, very particular when it comes to that, including a lot of times what I'll do is have to shave um, everyone, you know, people, patients' hair, uh, to prevent that infection risk and so um, but again we talk about that um, pretty extensively when you come see me for a preoperative visit um, like i mentioned to start uh, we're very we're very proud of the program that we built at abbott um, we consider this a comprehensive uh, movement disorder or dbs program uh, we handle everything from the preoperative evaluation to programming to uh, meeting with surgeons to post-operative care and physical therapy. Uh, we have really everything that we would possibly want at our fingertips uh, to help patients through this process. Uh, I think we've created a very efficient process, probably more efficient than many of the other programs that you'll see in the Twin Cities or, or even regionally. Um, we try and get people through this you know, within a couple of months where other programs may take six to nine months to get people through this. We're trying to do this in two to three months. We understand that once you make the decision that you want to have surgery, you don't want to wait six or nine months to get that taken care of. You want that done as quickly and as efficiently as possible, but also as safely as possible. And I think we've provided that to patients. Um, and again, uh, surgical implantation, we're one of the only sites in the region that will do uh, bilateral intracranial lead placement in the same setting. We've created such efficiencies in the operating room. Uh, and again, not skimping on any quality, but uh, creating such efficiency agencies with having common team members um, and you know making sure that people are there when they need to be there that uh, we can implant uh, both leads in about the same amount of time that most other places are doing a single lead uh, because of the consistency and efficiencies we've created. 
Uh, as far as outpatient follow-up, you know, we have multiple clinical locations, both myself and Dr. Rahek uh, have clinics uh, you know, all around the Twin Cities where we can see patients and, and do a lot of this preoperative or postoperative care. Unfortunately, uh, we only do surgery at Abbott down in Minneapolis. And again, and that's because of the time we put in to create efficiencies for that, but uh, can see patients, you know, both preoperative and postoperatively at many locations. We do have a monthly multidisciplinary consensus conference, as I touched on. Uh, that includes myself and Dr. Rahek, as well as the neuropsychologists, uh, the physical therapists that do the on and off testing, uh, our care coordinators with both Anushka and Kelly. Um, and so, you know, we really, uh, you know, treat each patient individually and you know, really dive in to see, are they a good candidate? What did all their preoperative testing show? Is there something that we need to repeat or do again, or maybe follow up in six months and then have those conversations uh, with the patients? Again, we have excellent results. And as you're seeing here, do many community educational events uh, just to spread the word about, you know, that this is an option and, and people do get really, uh, you know, get a lot of benefit and we have a high success with this. So, um, you know, if you do feel that you're a candidate, we have, you know, many different uh, avenues to, to get you into the program to get evaluation. And maybe you just need to talk to somebody more about this and, and understand how it would affect you. Um, and you know, are you would you be a good candidate potentially for DBS surgery? And sometimes we need to do more testing to figure that out. Um, as sort of a closing note, I want everyone to take away, you know, DBS surgery, although it's scary and um, and it is, you know, major brain surgery, it's very safe. Um, and I think the bottom two are, are the reasons, you know, when we look at the benefits of this versus the risk, this is very effective. We have excellent results. Um, again, unfortunately, we're unable to have a patient ambassador here with us today, but. Um, if you log on to some of the previous uh, educational events that we've had, and, and we do have some uh, patient testimonials on those, uh, I mean, these are unpaid people that, you know, we've, we've had, and they, they just, they can't say enough good things about their life after DBS surgery. Uh, and again, this can be life altering. So I think it's important for everyone to, to understand that. And again, it's, it's scary, um, but hopefully we can you know, walk you through the process and, and make it less scary. And hopefully I've done that today, uh, kind of cracking open that black box of how scary uh, brain surgery can be and, and the benefits that we can get from it. Uh, lastly, if there's any questions after the program, again, we're gonna be here um, to answer any questions that folks have. Uh, but if you do have any questions, we have a lot of resources. Um, the Alina DBS website is very good. It's very informative. It shares a lot of the same information that we've provided here today, uh, as well as the Naran Clinic websites. Um, and then uh, again, Anushka uh, and Kelly are very good resources as far as, um, you know, if you want to get into the program or, or have specific questions, they can be assistance with that. So with that, um, that's all I have to offer. Um, if there's any questions, um, you can we can either uh, kind of chime in, or if you want to raise your hand, then we can unmute you and and answer those questions. Both Dr. Rayek and myself are here and available uh, for that uh, at this point. I just want to let everyone know that we are going to unmute people. So if you'd like to ask your questions out loud, instead of typing them in the chat, you are welcome to do so. I have a question. Did anybody hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, I don't have the shakiness. I have the stiffness and unable to move at times kind of thing. Will that help? Will DBS help that? Yes, uh, yes I think. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Wright. Yeah, what you said was that you, you don't have the tremor, but you have a lot of stiffness, is that right? Right. And weak legs. So yes, we we can still help your symptoms often, especially if they respond to the dopamine medications, because um, we generally consider DBS to help the symptoms that the levodopa helps. So that can be that stiffness, uh, any muscle tightness, the slowness of movement, even if you don't have any of the the tremor symptoms. Okay, and and another question I have is: um, at night, do you leave everything connected when you sleep? Sorry, can you say when you're sleeping at night, is everything still connected and you're still moving the same amount? 
Yes, yeah, so, so it's not um, necessarily meant to improve sleep, but we often do see improved sleep with DBS because we just, we set it and, and leave it on 24 seven. And so it can give you some of that symptom relief overnight that, that can disrupt your sleep um, prior to getting surgery. Okay, I live in Northern Minnesota. Um, is there a po is it possible to get um, my follow up treatments closer to my home than Minneapolis? Um, that's a good question. There would still be some visits to Minneapolis, but now with um, telemedicine and virtual capabilities, and then um, we we've started partnering with a, a clinic in Duluth. There might be some some ways of coordinating. Um, I'm not that far north. I'm in between the cities in Duluth. So. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we would we would be able to work with you on that, and and maybe do some some different virtual visits in between, or like for programming the way it's set up right now, people have to be actually in the clinic. So, um, and there's not really a lot of neurologists that are comfortable doing deep brain stimulation programming. So, um, for the most part, you would still have to come in and see me, but um, we would be able to kind of talk through that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that people have? Question in the chat asking if we use the Medtronic device. Yeah, and I can touch on that. So there's actually uh, three devices on the market right now. Um, there's a, a device, Medtronic's been around for the longest um, and uh, they have uh, the newest uh, pulse generator that I discussed. And so we do use a lot of Medtronic product. Uh, there's also a company called Boston Scientific that has a product on the market that we utilize. Uh, and then uh, St. Jude or Abbott also has a product uh, and we are able to implant uh, any or each of those products. Uh, as part of our consensus meeting, when we get together on that monthly basis, uh, we discuss the different products, uh, knowing what we know about that, uh, and, and kind of recommend a product for each patient. Um, some have uh, little differences here and there that, that are important differences. And then when I'm having the preoperative discussion with the patient, we can go over all of those different products and, and why we think one would be better than the other. So uh, we do implant all the different products um, and, uh, and, you know, can, can have access to all of those. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have a friend in Texas who had it done, the DBS done for her essential tremor. And she had the wiring done. It was all done in one operation. What are the pros and cons to that? Um, I can touch on that. So um, uh, essential charm is a little bit different than DBS um, in that uh, the DBS patient or the Parkinson's patients, um, when they come in, you know, we have them off their medications and so to have them go through a long surgery uh, and then be off their medication and give them general anesthesia can be really challenging. Um, and so occasionally what we will do uh, is a single stage essential tremor uh, procedure. Um, the, the, I guess the only risk of that is just it's a very long procedure. So we still do that, uh, you know, awake first for implantation of the leads, uh, which generally takes about two to three hours with a, a essential tremor patient for bilateral lead placement. And then, uh, you know, another hour or so uh, under general anesthesia for completion of the system. Uh, we've done that from time to time. Most of the time, people want to recover first from the lead placement and then come back for the, the pulse generator and the extension leads or the battery pack placement. Uh, it seems to work the best, but uh, we can, you know, on, on an individual basis, we can figure that out very easily. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just add to that that since the programming isn't done usually anyway until three to four weeks after, it doesn't necessarily change your, your outcome or the course that way. I guess it would just save the person a trip, to, another trip to the hospital. So certain situations where you're coming from a long distance or things like that, then 
we could probably we work through that on a case by case basis. Okay. So I got another question. So the holes in your head, um, do they cover over flat or is there always, will people see something there? Yeah, so actually um, one step I, I didn't really discuss is uh, when we do uh, drill those holes into the skull uh, to get access to the brain, uh, there's these little caps that we have. Um, actually, I might have one right here. Um, the little caps actually will, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. So there's a little up here. Now that cap uh, will hold the lead in place and, uh, and you can see it's, it's a little bit raised. Uh, so you'll actually feel that, but it'll cover that hole so that, you know, that lead doesn't come out. Um, but you'll, you should be able to feel that right underneath the scalp, but it's, it's very minimal. It's only about uh, two to three millimeters thick. Uh, so very, very, um, very smooth overall, but that's what holds the lead in place. So the lead doesn't pull in and out of the brain. Yeah, Dr. Nelson gives everybody a nice buzz cut, close shave after or for the surgery. And, yeah. and so you know, before your hair grows back, you'll have more noticeable. And then, and then if, if like for men, especially if they're bald, you would still see some more of that. But for if you have hair that grows back over, it's, it's usually unrecognizable. Yeah, most of the time they heal up very nice. Even in, in, in uh, you know, people with thinning hair and stuff, it's very challenging sometimes to actually see where the incision is at. Okay. Are the holes in the front of the head or the back? Well, whereabouts, whereabouts are the holes in the head? Are they at the top or yep. towards so the they're kind of right. Yep, yeah, right, uh, kind of in the front area. If you just take, kind of come back from your eyes, one on each side, uh, just off the midline, but in front of the ears or kind of right at the ear level. So uh, right on the top of the head generally. Okay. And we use, you know, that um, neuro navigation, that CT scan, as well as some anatomical landmarks to, to figure that out. So it's very consistent from patient to patient, honestly. Okay. So I have a question. Go yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I have Parkinson's. Uh, my symptoms seem to be more on my right side. So you talked about putting in two leads. Um, would you still use two leads or how would you, would you do anything different or are the symptoms all the same or would the surgery be the same or that? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, take Yeah, so Dr. Rayak, why don't you go ahead? Oh, uh, so we, we often, um, we'll talk about that and, and with the motor testing, we'll, um, look at, at where your symptoms are and how one-sided they are. Usually the symptoms are more recognizable on one side, but people after a certain number of years of having Parkinson's have symptoms on the other side. You just don't recognize it as much because you're so focused on where your symptoms are the worst. So it um, often will be more noticeable if we just treat one side and then people go through the surgery process and then all of a sudden say, oh my gosh, my left side is now really bothersome. And then they kind of want to get that second side done um, pretty quickly after the first side. So we tend to have the approach and Dr. Nelson um, kind of will talk to you about that in the clinic too. But um, if we get both leads in right away, then you don't have to go through that whole process again um, a year or two or even six months later. And, and so we often will use both leads right away, even though you're not aware of it at the time. And if, if it really is one-sided, we often can just turn one side on and then wait, you know, and see how things go and then use that, that other side later. So just nice to have it done right off the bat. Yeah, and I generally tell people it takes about 30 more minutes for us in the operating room during that first stage to implant a second lead because we have everything all set up and ready to go. And so there's very few instances where 
I think people benefit from single lead placement, especially in, in either of these diseases, Parkinson's or essential tremor, uh, because it's a bilateral disease. It happens at both sides of the brain. And so it just makes sense uh, to, you know, to accommodate that, you know, at, at one time. Now with the uh, devices that we use, we can independently program both of those sides. So um, each lead can be independently programmed so that if you have more symptoms on the right side, that left lead, we can program a little bit higher than the right lead, or maybe even as Dr. Rayek said, shut that right lead off until we need it. So uh, there's definitely plenty of options that we have. Uh, and again, some of those are discussed on a case by case basis, depending on, uh, you know, your disease, the, you know, how long you've had it, the progress, the, um, all that kind of stuff. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Another question we get is how long do you get benefit for? Um, and that's um, been studied definitely for five years after surgery, especially for, for Parkinson's. It's been looked at extensively and then they've done some longer term follow-ups and just from following patients now over, over years, we see continued benefit even beyond that five-year time frame. but they've done actual you know, studies and follow-up trials showing sustained benefit even after five years with your motor symptoms. And another question, do you want to take this, Dr. Nelson, is in insurance. Everybody also wants to know if insurance will will cover. Yeah, and, and generally, you know, this is a well-described treatment uh, option for patients with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. And uh, the way we do our preoperative testing, including the on-off testing, as well as uh, the neuropsych evaluation, generally we don't have any troubles with getting this approved by, you know, any of the major insurance uh, carriers or providers. Uh, obviously, with Medicare uh, and Medicaid as well, you know, this is, again, a, a very uh, well-recognized treatment uh, option. And so uh, my office works uh, a lot with the patients to get, you know, all that pre-approval and we'll do a lot of that work um, for you or on your behalf, um, you know, if we decide to proceed forward with surgery. So that always comes up, but generally it it's, uh, tends not to be a huge issue. I see another question in the chat of how long the battery lasts. So there are different batteries available. So Medtronic um, has a non-rechargeable that's new that will last uh, at least five years. They're saying five to seven years, depending on how much charge it needs to be putting out. Um, so quite a bit of um, time there. And then there's rechargeables available that last 15 years, and then you charge that every one to two weeks, usually for about an hour. So that's part of the discussion of, of which battery you would want and, and your comfort level with charging versus um, getting, getting the non-rechargeable and which brand we choose. I think if there's no other questions, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, I think it was a really helpful uh, conversation to have. You guys uh, had a lot of really great questions, which is good. Um, and I think if you, you know, feel that you want to learn more uh, about uh, DBS or the process, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to you know, create, uh, set up a, a meeting with you to discuss this, see if you'd be a good candidate, see if there's more testing that we should do to, to identify that. And again, we have the, the process and the program to, uh, to make sure that we're able to do that efficiently. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, and have a good rest of the day. 
Thank you, everybody. And please feel free to get in touch with Kelly or I if you have any questions after today's program. Thank you.